So, I don't know if you all saw the moon last night, but wow, that was cool. Um, I think my wife said it was the straw moon or the corn moon. It's not the harvest moon. You know, I said that thing about listening to your wife, listening to your spouse. I, yeah, mm, mm. we were both taking pictures of it and just gawking at it. Uh, the way the clouds looked like you almost get the silver quality in the clouds and some of it was reflecting the moonlight. It was just magic. Uh, and where we live now, it came up really big, like shockingly so. You know, we were driving down the road and uh, it popped out from behind the trees. We both kind of did the, what is that? Like, cause it was that big. So sometimes in art, you can go for a bit more realism. You can go for uh, a representation of the original. I like a little bit of abstractionism. So in this painting, we're gonna be doing the moon. I'm gonna do it as big as it felt, not as big as it actually was. Uh, you can do, you know, whatever, but I kind of feel like sometimes it's fun to do a little abstractionism, a little uh, visual embellishment for lack of a better word. Uh, so we're both, looking at the moon and obviously any of you know who know who do photography is unless you have the right setup uh you're not going to actually get the colors that you see in that so we got some colors but you know and i'm not picking on the phone but it's off of the iphone 11 x pro or whatever the heck it is uh it's a great phone um uh, but again it's limited because the lens is really only this big so if you want to get a lot of more true lighting you have to have a much bigger lens uh, another way to explain this is you know picture a rainwater catchment system if we're going to talk about farming you if you have a little little cup a shot glass the rain falling in is going to take a long time to fill that up if you had a great big wide pan you're going to catch more rainwater faster so the lens is the same way. You're limited by the physical nature of the size of the lens. Doesn't matter how good the components of the camera are, at a certain point you are pushing the limits of what is physically possible with a lens that big. So we didn't have a big camera with us so we couldn't get the true color of the moon. Also, when I'm looking to do a landscape painting, and, and if you're thinking about doing these, you do not have to just paint what you see you can make a landscape painting. And a lot of them, that's what I do. People are like, how do you do that? I either Photoshop together a bunch of different images into a rough draft, and then I work off the rough draft. Uh, or I draw right on a piece of paper. So right here, I've got a photograph from last night. That's my rough draft for my painting, that whole thing. The moon may be this size. I'm gonna maybe put some trees in here and maybe have some grass in the front, maybe have a tree over there. That's it, that's my reference. What do I need this for? Well, this is really good because it gives me the colors or close to the colors. I know as a tattoo artist, I think of a lot of colors by their uh, ink name. So I use Eternal Ink. Um, and the way this actually looked was kind of like a mixture between Graveyard Dark and Periwinkle. Uh, the orange in it was like true gold with a little bit of, uh, I'd say it was the perfect orange they had years ago, which I wish they would bring back. That was on the outside edge of it with maybe a hint of either magenta or salmon, but just a little bit. Uh, the clouds from below, you could see a transition from, uh, there's another color that's like graveside dark, but it's like a purple. Uh, and it's a purple or like, I sometimes call it black grape. So it'd be that cut with orange and yellow to get a different transition in the clouds. And some of the clouds would actually look like silver leaf. So this interesting modeling appearance. The reason I'm telling you this is that if you have a frame of reference for what the colors are, and you have a general understanding of the layout of the piece, then you can make it whatever you want. It's gonna be dependent on a few things. It's either gonna be dependent on the colors or it's gonna be dependent on the forms. You know, you can do one or the other. So, uh, it, how do I explain that? Um, if you have uh, like a coloring book, the forms are perfect. So when a child takes a crayon and they do their amazing coloring, like, look, the elephant is green. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> like, you look at that and you go, you know, it's an elephant, not because Picasso drew it, but because 
uh, the outline was there and it said, this is the form of the elephant, you know, this is elephant form. Uh, the other way to do something like this would be, um, you could do, you could do predictable forms. You could also do like pattern work. So like if you're just putting down modeling yellows, bright, and then gold, and then transition to blue, the brain kind of goes, is that the sun? Like it's a pattern. It's a predictable pattern. Uh, so those things can be loose. If it was a flower, it could have loose brush marks, but you're kind of adhering to the overall form of the flower while maybe the brush marks and the color is the more important thing. But it's not so abstract that the brain can't figure it out. Like that type of suggesting the form of art versus very illustrative hard line version of art is very dependent on a recognizable system of visual imagery or symbols that the brain automatically picks up. So if you take that loose brushwork, and I'm going off on a tangent now as always, uh, and you work in a very loose pattern where color is the most important thing, you can do more brushwork the bigger you make the object and the more simpler it is. So if you have a, uh, a pumpkin and a leaf, uh, and you did it the size of a wall, you can literally have huge swatches of color that are kind of a concophony of, you know, mashed insanity visually, uh, but at a distance it reads as a leaf. And then people can get up close and go, I love the texture of the brush marks. The problem is the smaller you do this, uh, the more simple the shapes have to be. They really just do. Years ago I did a uh, bridge painting uh, down in Plymouth, Massachusetts with a nighttime bridge painting. Uh, at the time I was doing experimentation where I would paint without any additional lighting in the dark and I would have to fight with moonlight or starlight to see my colors. Um, and then I would paint what I thought I saw the next day on a separate canvas. And what we would do is we just did a show of these and uh, they were side by side. And so what you would do is you'd, you could dim the light. Each one had like a curtain around it. So you have the light inside and you can shut the light off and you can see it in the dark. And what was fun about it was that when you shut the lights off on the one that I did in the dark, it actually looked better than the one that was, um, that was uh, painted to replicate that effect. So in any case, uh, but the point is, is so years ago I had this painting I did, my uncle John got it at one point and God only knows where it is now where it was a bridge in a park in Plymouth, Mass, and it was done in the evening. And it was minimalism, so I used dots, and it was all dots, the whole thing, just... And it was basically just a stubby brush that I was mashing against the canvas. Um, I don't know where that piece is, it's probably lost to history, I mean, who knows. But it worked because it was silhouettes of trees, it was kind of the silhouette of the bridge, it was illuminated by a street light, it was illuminated by the moon, uh, I did another one that a former friend of mine now has, and he probably destroyed it, but it's uh, just the moonlight on water. Not the moon, not the water, like so almost abstractly simple, but immediately your brain was like, that's moonlight on water. It's fun stuff to do, but it has to be simple enough. So if you're into painting or you're getting into this and you want to understand it better, and you're trying to do different effects, uh, there's always that line. You can, you can have a little bit more English on it if you want, but it has to be recognizable, otherwise you get an abstractionism or complete abstract art, which is completely acceptable, um, like Jackson Pollock type, Pollock type stuff. But if you want it to be recognizable, you have to stay within the realm of forms. So, so basically, was that a long enough rant? Jeepers creepers. Uh, so basically I have my color palette here uh, of uh, kind of the idea of the colors I want. Um, and I'm thinking about how big I want to make the moon, you know? I'm thinking that big. I'm going to do something on cheating right now. People use the phrase cheating, and it drives me absolutely nuts. Uh, if you're getting the desired effect, who cares? So when people go, how do you get a circle on a canvas? There you go. Um, if you're drawing something and you need a perfect circle, you will never make a more perfect circle than a perfect circle. And while it's nice to be able to draw one freehand, uh, if you're not Michelangelo, who did that to get his certificate to paint the Sistine Chapel, his, uh, war his charter, um, 
then it's perfectly acceptable to get a shape, a circle maker or something, and make a circle. Just to keep this in mind, if you're using a compass, the pointy end is going to damage your surface. So don't do that. Uh, you could use rubber and put the pointy end on the rubber piece and then spin it. Uh, I prefer just to get an object, or you could take a compass, draw on a piece of cardboard, cut that out, get it the way you want it. Uh, to make it perfect, use uh, sandpaper on the edge of the cardboard. Very gently, you can get it to an absolute perfect curve. And uh, gently, it has to be dry too. Um, you can make circles whatever size you want. And then you don't have to sit there and try to figure out how to draw a perfect circle. And then you've done a painting that everything's great except for you're like, yeah, the moon looks like it got a bit squished. That's not good. Um, yeah, so another thing and I want to point this out to you is that when painting luminaries uh, in the sky or on a surface, uh, lights, um, moons, uh, the sun, stars, doesn't matter what it is, if you put a hard edge around them uh, that's dark, it may make them appear brighter, but it will also make them appear very flat and not glowing. To get the glowing effect, what we're gonna use is we're gonna go in dark on the edge of this moon, but not black. And before we go completely like clean edge circle, uh, we will just do a slight bit of fade, just the smallest bit. The eye reads that as light emanating uh, because it's diffusing light. Light photons are blasting off in all directions and it is eliminating that clean edge. The edge does appear, uh, obviously, if you take a picture of the sun and the moon, you're gonna get that perfect circle. Just keep in mind that you're dancing between illustrating what's actually going on, because you're not painting an actual light source coming to the person's eyes, and um, what, how the eye reads it. And the eye knows it's a circle. Uh, if you don't do the circle right, the eye can tell the circle is not accurate. So we'll use that as our base. Um, this is a cradled piece, so I think I'm going to do uh, an element on the outside edge. So that should be fun. Uh, I wanted an apple tree in here, so here's my insane apple tree. My illustration skills are beyond on point. Ridiculous. Some people are like, how perfect do you want your drawing? It doesn't matter. It's up to you. Uh, if you like a guide, great. If you're not feeling a guide, skip it. Um, as far as, let's see, uh, you're looking at this and you go, well, what'd you draw it with? Graphite. And Jay, didn't you tell us that graphite is bad? for a painting. Aren't you not supposed to use it? I did say that. And now I'm gonna say something else about it. Graphite is a lubricant, and graphite does mean that your paint won't stick. But graphite is also, um, in small amounts, it's not gonna be a problem. Uh, you'd have to, when I say you can't paint over graphite, uh, traditionally they wouldn't have, is because traditionally they would have been using silver point and they would have done a full scale drawing with cross hatching. There would be layers and layers of this. If you put a few marks of a pencil on the surface, you're not gonna ruin the surface. Um, but you do wanna be careful of it. Then the other thing that we're gonna do to prevent this from being a problem is we're gonna do a very, very, very light coat of DeMar varnish. Just the lightest coat. We're gonna just spritz it with DeMar varnish, why? It's gonna seal it. And as long as it's sealed, the paint and the graphite never interact. Yeah. So we could do that. Or honestly, you could just paint on it. Uh, it's not that much graphite. So I probably will remove a little bit of the moon edges on the fence post so as not to compromise what the paint should look like. Don't be afraid to try things. And oh, last, last but not least, um, whenever painting, and I know I've probably mentioned this before, you don't want, uh, you really do not want to be pulling out your farthest spectrum colors. It's not always necessary to have them. You do not always have to have white. You do not always have to have black. It is not a requirement. Uh, but what's more important is your tonal range. Uh, so while this painting is at night and could potentially have black in it, it's not as much as you'd think. Um, it's going to depend on how it reads. But if you are going to use black, it's a base color. It is not for the upper part of the painting. I have yet to decide whether or not I'm doing an underpainting with this. 
go with what uh what works so i've decided i'm gold leaf in the moon let's see what the hell that does it's going to be kind of cool i might be able to get a neat sparkle effect it's going to hold me back on starting the piece uh for a little while because i gotta let that dry but i got other pieces to work on so i'll take the break okay so i did talk a little bit about the forest god concept the last time that i was talking about this and It'll probably go together in one video. Uh, before I get too into this, I want to point out something. Now, there's an artist uh, that I used to keep company with. Uh, we had a falling out, but I own several pieces of their work. This is not based on their work. However, the more I looked at it, the more I felt it reminded me of their work. And while the idea behind it is very different, um, I personally believe in <clears throat> charity. I don't believe in forced charity. Like, I don't believe the government should take from you at gunpoint and give it to somebody else. Uh, that's slavery, in my opinion. And people who root for that are rooting for slavery. Um, I don't owe anyone an explanation for my art right now. However, I'm, I want to demonstrate something about charity and about honor and about how we are supposed to be I think to each other as Americans. Uh, while I don't agree with this artist, if you look up atavism idols, you will find an artist who takes uh, religious, uh, discarded religious sculptures, statues, and paintings, and makes them into like pagan forest art. Um, the reason I am pointing them out is because even though I don't, I bought their work, I don't owe them anything, they don't paint like I do. They, they paint over other found objects. I respect their work, and because I'm an artist and I respect other artists, I am doing the charitable thing by sharing their name and directing you to them. Um, because I believe that you fix and heal the world with charity and hard work not through force or threat of violence. That being said, um, so here we have our forest god. Now, I've done the drawing. Uh, I did the rough and created the line drawing on the iPad Pro. I love the iPad Pro. It's a great tool uh, to practice making art, to make art for whatever you choose. I like the tactile sensation of an actual painting. So it's not that iPad Pro paintings aren't art, it's that I just prefer doing this. Um, so we did our uh, drawing on that, we printed it out. This is again, when I'm talking about cheating. Um, somebody says, well, why didn't you just draw it on that? I already drew it. Why do I have to redraw it again and again and again and again? If I drew it once and that's the way I want it, that's fine. I used a ball, uh, a ball pen, point pen, can't talk. I used a uh, ballpoint pen and traced over it with a piece of graphite transfer paper underneath. I taped it down on the edge and to the bottom when I did that. Then in between, I went in, I'm gonna show you in a second, I did some gold leafing. Then I put the transfer paper back down and I retraced the part that I had gold leafed. Uh, then I let that dry. So now I can remove the paper. The reason why I left the top edge is that when I retraced that section on the gold leaf, it would match up. So, we'll take this off. There we go. So we have our god, our forest god. We've got the outline. I've got the gold leaf. You can have some over uh, wiping with the gold leaf. The visual effect that this is going to involve is going to be very interesting, I think, so. Um, but yeah, you don't have to, you overlap a little with the gold leaf, don't, don't worry about that. It's more important that you get the parts in here that you needed to, and I did. I then went in with um, basically a Sharpie permanent marker, and I just kind of drew on the gold leaf. Uh, and then I spritzed it with a light amount of DeMar varnish. There are better ways to do that. I was just, felt like doing that. I also sprayed over the whole thing with DeMar varnish, so it does not... Um, so it doesn't end up moving any of the graphite. 
because like I said, you don't want to use graphite in a large quantity, but small amounts, no big deal. I did go around the eyes. Uh, normally I don't do that uh, with these type of things, but I feel like I'm going to lose them if I don't. So there we go. Now we're going to start our underpainting and we're going to go in and we're going to lay down the whole thing, black and gray, just like we did with the other one. And then we will be layering our color on top of it. With this painting, I really want to stay away from any color that isn't red. Uh, the fire should have a real component to it, but the rest of this painting is almost going to be black and white. It's going to be reds, black and white. When I do this painting, I'm thinking of a literal forest god. Uh, the energy that was here before we had names for it. So this animal, the St. Sebastian type-esque uh, reflective character is the beast that uh, carried us on its flesh. Uh, it clothed us as uh, many people in the northern parts of the world ate deer, uh, interacted with deer, worshipped deer. This animal became the representation of most of our northern uh, European fertility rites. It has a connection to those practices here in North America. So. We are doing that. We're also doing a little commentary on something that has been going on since the beginning of time, which is human beings are doing again another cave painting of an animal they want to eat. We've been doing it, uh, what are the earliest cave paintings? Go back more than 50,000 years, uh, same thing. You know, We didn't uh, first make axes because we weren't gonna cut down trees or, or cut meat. Uh, we didn't make knives and spear points so that we could uh, go cut reams of paper for our boss. We were interacting with nature. Uh, we painted on cave walls the things we valued, and the things we valued were these giant ruminators that sustained us, uh, and that's the way it worked. And over time, uh, especially in European art, you can actually watch the descent of the large ruminators in paintings. And eventually we start to replace the hunted ruminators with cattle and livestock. Uh, we keep growing this and then eventually we don't own livestock and we have fields of plants that we work on for other people. And then we don't even own those fields anymore. This is a cycle that you can see that has happened to people uh, in this country, especially people who are uh, indigenous and people who are of African American descent, um, people who, are, uh, who couldn't pass for white uh, but this has also been true as far as the labor market for other groups of people coming in. Uh, whenever human beings see other, they step on other, unfortunately. So we continue to make art that is, uh, contains the animal until eventually it's, you know, you're looking at paintings in the you know, 1600s where they're just painting food. Um, we just have food. Look at all the food we've got. Look at this opulent food. Um, even the tulip paintings in... Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands uh, reflect the garish obsession with the haves and the have-nots, the tulips themselves bearing bloodied petals and uh, commentary on the disparaging uh, gap between those who have and those who have not. But I think that it was probably always the case. It just through years of reductionist agriculture, you're diminishing the land so much that people value that as the main component. Uh, it's not so much, in my mind, capitalism as it is reductionist agriculture that ruins everything, and that's exactly why the Fertile Crescent is the way it is, uh, and is why human beings following the codfish came to the United States uh, in search of better fishing and hunting grounds. And through harvesting in uh, a manner that is not regenerative, we destroyed those systems. But ingenuity destroys systems too. Dan Flores and his, uh, he wrote a book about uh, the American Serengeti, I believe it's called. And uh, I'm gonna screw that up. And so Flores basically talks about how the horse actually evolved here in North America was reintroduced by the Spanish, and at the time uh, it was reintroduced by the Spanish, it changed the hunting dynamic of plains people interacting with the bison. All of a sudden now they had a technique where they could move greater masses of bison, but they didn't, they had gained one part of the equation that they hadn't 
gotten the point where gotten to the point where a uh, fashion of doing it regeneratively was introduced. So you start out with the most basic, which is you just stampede them off a cliff. Uh, that alone reduced the bison numbers by over 50%. Just that little introduction of uh, technology or, uh, you know, and animal influence. So the, the point of this is, is that um, human beings are continually relearning the lesson where they don't understand the balance between the ruminant and themselves. But I wanted to bring back into consciousness the idea of this element pre the language, pre the uh, overwhelming influence on the land and destruction of resources, that at one point in time, we lived harmoniously and valued each other.